Hey guys, Frank Cox here, the Barbecue Pit Engineer. On today's podcast, we're going to talk about a question I got recently from a customer in the chat box on smokerplans.net was, uh, why is my food black all the time? How can I prevent this? Stay tuned. Hey guys, so I'm driving in my truck on the way to the shop to paint smokers today, and I'm sorry for the shaky camera if you're watching this on video. Um, I drive a gravel road every day on my way to the shop, and uh, so I'm just kind of taking it easy here. Saw a mother uh, turkey hen and a bunch of baby uh, turkeys going across the road a minute ago. It's pretty awesome. But uh, that's not what we're talking about today. On today's podcast, I wanted to talk to you about a uh, question I recently got in the chat inbox on smokerplans.net. Um, my wife and I, Lisa and I, we monitor that uh, daily and uh, actually respond to questions there. Uh, sometimes it might take a little bit to respond to a question there, but we, we try to be as quick as possible. Um, I am welding or painting, like today I'll be painting a smoker. But um, anyway, the question was, he was asking about his food being black and what this black is, it's not bark we're talking about. It's more of just like a sooty kind of a wet. It's usually wet. I've seen this before many times. Usually it comes on chicken is where you'll see it the most. It'll be almost like no red. It'll be like a, almost like you wipe your finger across it and you can wipe it off. Uh, some guys will actually take like a towel if they've got that. And this is that oversmoked taste that people talk about. When you go to a barbecue restaurant and you're just like all psyched, you're going to eat some Missouri barbecue or something or some kind of, you know, some other whatever kind of barbecue you're going to eat. And the reason I said Missouri is because a lot of places around here use these old rotisseries called oilers or from J&R Manufacturing. And those were notorious for that. Um, usually what it is, this is a symptom of a dirty fire. And what I mean by a dirty fire is it's not toxic fire, really. I mean, it's not healthy for you. The, the residue is not good for you. But it's not like we're burning tires or something in there. That's what I mean by toxic. Actually, what it usually is, is improper combustion that leads to some kind of condensation and soot out of the air inside the smoker environment that settles out on the surface of the food as it's going through the cooking chamber. And you know, so let's just talk about what causes this. So a lot of the times what you're gonna run into is uh, you'll see these guys that buy like wood from local just wood cutters. They're not barbecue like wood cutters. It's just a guy that has a farm down the road that brings them a truckload of wood every so often. And that wood is either too green or there could be, especially with red oak, you'll find this with red oak a lot because the red oak, sorry, it's a bumpy spot here, because the red oak ha has a higher tendon, higher moisture, uh, you know, in it, just out the gate. Like it's gonna smoke a lot, uh, white oak is. If, if it's been, especially if it's been freshly cut or if it's a dead tree that was standing that they cut down and when they cut it down the outside inch of the wood actually is pretty porous now because it's been dead and it starts swelling up and uh, everywhere that water that wood rots moisture comes in and you wind up with really wet wood so um, green wood is like a live tree that was standing and we cut it down and it's still got wet sap the tree's still basically alive you know it's got so much moisture in it so that that those two things will lead to too much moisture in your wood and that will lead to a smoldering wood and that smoldering wood is what causes the the, the uh, soot smoldering wood has a lot of moisture in it that carries that soot and smoldering uh, smoke away from the from the fire so the only way to really fix that situation is to change the wood that you're buying. Get get some wood that's dry. Um, when I say dry, man, this well, this is what they call a six dollar an hour road grader operator. Just so you know, that's what we used to say around here. This is bad. Anyway, sorry about that. So 
the way to fix that is you want to get around eight percent or so moisture in your wood now if you buy wood from a wood producer like around here there's a couple of them in missouri chigger creek is one of them that you'll find a lot of places um, vaughn wood products is another missouri company and i know there's a ton more out there um, these companies ship wood and so in order for them to ship wood to your home uh, already cut and seasoned they have to kiln dry it and that's the, the there's a uh, quarantine rule uh, in most states that you can't ship wood or transport wood across the border without having the without first having uh, the moisture content below a certain amount and this is to kill the bugs and uh, get rid of the get rid of the bugs out of the wood that means we've heated it up enough to get rid of any pests or anything that would uh, like the uh, wood borer beetle is one of them uh, for ash wood and stuff so that's kind of what we're doing right there is we're trying to literally kiln dry or season this wood. So a lot of guys will stack it in such a manner that you can get a lot of air in between the pieces. So they'll put two pieces one way and then cross it in two pieces the other way and uh, stack that wood one row deep, um, in some cases two rows deep, and they'll let it sit for months, like four months. Um, and that, that actually will uh, be the same as kiln drying and it just takes a lot longer um, and wood will season over the winter too it's it's not like it won't just in cold in warm temperatures or something so another way another thing that causes this uh, this sooty black buildup is just improper combustion because of lack of enough combustion air so what you'll find is is that if you're putting too much fuel Think about a carburetor, in my case, a furnace, like a gas burner. Um, if, you, if you put too much fuel and not enough uh, oxygen or combustion air to the fire, you're gonna have a sooty, rich, you know, nasty fire. It's, it's, not, it's not gonna be burning clean. And uh, basically what, I just parked here at the shop, basically what that's gonna lead to is uh, you know you're going to be too rich. There's not enough oxygen. This will also cause soot. If you want to experiment with this, say that you don't have this trouble and you want to play around and figure this out. Build a good fire. You know, get a good coal bed going. Build a good fire in your pit and then shut the smokestack damper like three quarters of the way shut or more, and uh, just watch what happens. At some point, you're going to be backdrafting air out the firebox inlet. Um, and you can do the other way around too. If you open your smokestack and then, excuse me, and then close the uh, air inlet on the firebox, you're gonna start to see that smoke is gonna turn white. And, and uh, that white smoke is gonna be basically just smoldery, sooty, nasty. It's gonna start stinking like, like uh, a, poor, a rich burning fire. So both of those scenarios we can troubleshoot basically looking at the color of the smoke or the direction of the air, the smoke leaving your, your firebox air inlet or going out the smokestack white. And um, what you're getting into there is uh, that scenario is typically something like this. In the real world, if you can't fix it, it's probably that your firebox is undersized. So why do I say undersized? You see a guy put a 24 inch pipe, um, you know, on a thousand gallon pit, hypothetically. Let's just say someone did that. What you're gonna have is, is you're not gonna have enough air actually in there for moving through the pit. Once the pit starts to warm up, that pit is a thousand gallons. And so we need to move air through that pit and change that volume of air out periodically throughout your cook. Well, you're only feeding it with, like it's like running a four cylinder motor in a big old grand marquee car. Like you just don't have enough capacity in that firebox to move not just smoke and heat, but you don't have enough air moving through that pit in order to deliver for the demand of that pit, if that makes sense. The, the size of the pit is the load. So undersized firebox, um, you can build a giant firebox, but if the throat opening is too small, that's like, you see these guys that always post these pictures of really cool ornate smokers and they'll usually have like this air compressor tank or something on one side that's vertical, you know, and then they'll have like a six inch pipe running from that 
through midair and then tying into the end of their cooking chamber, which is typically another air compressor tank on its side. And so you've got this scenario where the firebox has plenty of volume for that cooking chamber, but the transport mechanism to deliver that air from the firebox to the cook chamber is undersized. So now we've just got this fire that's doing whatever it, it can in the, in the firebox. Usually they wind up opening the door up for more air and they wind up throwing a lot more fuel on the fire. Um, in that case, we, we can't move enough air into the cook chamber so we don't make temp and we wind up smoldering our fire um, in that scenario too. And then an undersized smokestack is the third place you'll have this problem. So to recap here, the first place in this scenario is an undersized firebox. The second thing is an undersized throat opening. The third thing is an undersized smokestack. Um, if you have an undersized smokestack, basically it's like closing your damper. That's basically a, a really simple way to explain it. Let's say we've got a 500 gallon pit and on that pit, normally I'm putting a six inch smokestack that's about 60 inches tall. And uh, that's, that's about right for that size pit. You can go eight inches if you want, you can go longer if you want, whatever. That's gonna have some other issues, but it's not gonna cause this problem. If you put a four inch smokestack on that pit, doesn't you're not gonna have enough surface area to get, it's not really, you can make it as long as you want. But if that thing is choked off to four inches, you're gonna cause some backdraft issues. At that point, the only thing you can hope for is pressurizing the cook chamber and then pushing that smoke out that four inch stack. The thing about air and smokers that, that I always, like I take for granted because I did all this refrigeration food equipment work for so long, um, a lot of that was duct work, you know, exhaust systems uh, over ho hoods over, uh, over stoves, building air pressure balance. Like when you walk in a restaurant, we want that the kitchen side of that restaurant to be in a slightly more negative pressure than the dining room. And the reason for that is, is because we wanna make sure that the kitchen air isn't going into the, the, the dining air. If you ever walk into a restaurant and you're just like grease everywhere and you're choked out, that's what's wrong in the building is that the, the kitchen is either either the whole building is in a negative or the, the kitchen itself is in a higher pressure. And when we talk about pressure, we're talking about this this word static pressure is what, what you'll hear us say uh, when we're talking about air pressure and building balance and duct work and all of this stuff. It's the same thing in your smoker. It's exactly the same thing. So what we wind up with is this pressure differential and that's what we're talking about with static pressure. So we have inches water column is what that's measured. It's just gonna go a little bit techno babble on you here. We can say computational fluid dying. I'm gonna get this on there. This is on the Frank at Smoker Builder, the Smoker Builder podcast, barbecue engineer. Okay, I'm gonna say it because it's driving me crazy is people that really have no idea what this phenomenon called computational fluid dynamics really is, okay? And I love it that people say it and I always keep my mouth shut and I can almost always tell they have no idea what they're talking about or they're, they've are they paid somebody to tell them numbers and those they're trusting that guy with the numbers, right? And they don't understand what they said. Not gonna call anybody out, but that's really what I believe. Okay, I know it, I did it for 28 years. I paid people to do it for me also employee wise. I got paid by every restaurant you ever heard of to do this. So anyway, here's the truth of it. Okay, so big claim there. I had to get it off my chest. So uh, what happens is we have this differential pressure across a wall or a filter or something like that. We've got this zone. We're dividing it into two places. And the static pressure is the difference in pressure, the pressure differential between those two zones, okay? Now we measure that in a thing called inches water column, okay? And uh, there's all kinds of instruments to measure this with. Most of them are not temperature friendly, but you can do it, okay? So what we would do is, okay, let me define like inches, cent inches and feet, centimeters and meters, okay? Now we've got inches water column and PSI, okay? 
So for every one PSI, there's, to give you an idea of the dynamics we're playing with here, for every one PSI, there's 28 inches of water column. Okay, to put that in English, for every one inch, or for every one foot, there's 12 inches, right? Okay, for pressure, we're measuring in inches water column and PSI. So one PSI, and then less than one PSI is, uh, is inches water column. Okay, now what that is, for every one PSI, there's 28 inches of water column, okay? Now, what we're talking about here, when we talk about pressure differential, this is how sensitive it is with design. Any kind of fluid dynamics, we're dealing with half of one inch water column. So, so literally, not a half a PSI, that's 14 inches, right? We're dealing with a half of one PSI, okay? I'm sorry, a half of one inch water column is what we're dealing with here. So that's usually the difference in building pressure. And you have to have really precise instrumentation to read this. I got one called a magna helic gauge that I used to use in building balance. And I've got videos on an old account called Food Tech Dudes on Instagram. If you wanna go back, you can go back far enough and I'm working in a Buffalo Wild Wings and this thing is going wham, wham. The needle on that thing is all over the place. Every time somebody opens a door, that needle pegs one way or another. Every time something, when they finally get it down where we want it, the kitchen has to be a quarter of an inch or so lower, quarter of one inch lower than the dining room, right? Every time a door opens, it changes that. So that's what we're doing on a smoker. Exactly what I just told you is what's happening in a smoker. So I get excited talking about that because it, it's, it's really cool to see that dynamic in these pits. Now, we're gonna increase the temperature of that zone. Now we've changed the density of the air and we're putting extra stuff in it, right? So we have all these other things that are happening inside of a smoker. And when I say that the cook chamber will need to be pressurized, that means that we're gonna probably have to increase that pressure up. We're not going to one PSI. It's still not a huge amount. It's, it's like if we were running a half inch negative before in the cook chamber, now we're gonna have to go a half or a full inch of water column more positive in the cooking chamber than we were before in order to push, we're tying it back to that four inch stack, in order to push air out of that smokestack, right? So that's dynamics in, in a nutshell. Listen to that about 15 times if, if uh, you really wanna understand it. Um, you can also jump into smokerbuilderu.com and uh, I love talking about this stuff, so I, I tend to kind of like hold way, 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 way back because it's just barbecue. We don't need to go that finite with our design, but I'm just telling you it can happen if it's important to you. If you really want to fix that soot problem, the thing you got to get fixed is your fuel first, then your air, and the air can be any problem. Like fuel can be not enough, or uh, the fuel problem can be too wet or or bad fuel, like just like in a carburetor, wrong fuel in the carburetor, it's not gonna burn. It can, you have all the gas you want, but if it's not good fuel, it's not gonna burn. If it's not the proper fuel, it's not gonna burn. So the same thing in, in a smoker. Then we go to, uh, so the wood is no good, right? The wood's too green, whatever. And then we get into like not enough air. So I hope that helps somebody. Let me know in the comments on whatever platform you're listening to this on. I typically post this as an audio only on uh, the Smoker Builder podcast. You can hear us on every platform, basically. If it's a podcast platform, this podcast should be there. Um, and then you can also go to YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, smokerbuilderu.com, any of these other places, and I post the video portion of this. Um, once again, I apologize for the shaky video at the very beginning. If you're watching on video, drop me a comment. Let's talk fluid dyne. Let's talk. Let's forget the computer. We don't need that, right? We don't need computational. I don't need that. Okay. Let's just talk about it. Just fluid dynamics. That's what this is, right? And uh, heat transfer and fluid dynamics. I'll always say this, a good refrigeration guy, good refrigeration guy can outwork pretty much anybody on this kind of stuff. You know, you just gotta, it's it's just moving temperature and moving air. And uh, 
that's fun to me. So anyway, if you if you want to talk more about this, like I said, join one of those platforms, whatever. Another thing is, is if you want a pit that you can rely on, barbecue engineer right here. If you want to build it yourself, get a set of plans. If you want me to build it for you, hit me up. I can do it. That's what I'm doing now. So appreciate you guys. Have a great day. Enjoy barbecue. Peace.